talk to anybody of my generation that will be the exorcist, the omen, Rosemary's baby. You know, it's always the same ones. Now you talk to the younger generation, they said, oh, you know, I was scared to death watching House of Wax. You know, and I don't know what, you know. <laughs> everyone. I hope you're all having an amazing day today. My name is Talal and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we are joined by a very special guest. He is one of the most talented and versatile content creators of the last 30 years. He's directed videos for Sir Elton John, Janet Jackson, The Spice Girls, and feature films for some of the biggest movie franchises of all time. On the show today, Mr. Marcus Misbell. How are you? Hello, how are you? You're a big part of my day today. Uh, <laughs> hey, well, we appreciate it, and we truly appreciate you making some time for, uh, for the show today. Before we begin, how have you been the last eight to nine months? We're living in this crazy world right now, and... What have you been doing to keep busy? What, what have you been up to? You know, uh, half a year before the virus, I decided to retire. And um, so in a way, that was great practice for quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you knew before all of us that something was going to happen. Um, to tell you the truth, I, um, I already decided to get out when, when, when Trump got elected the first time around. And I said, like, you know, I wonder about my parents' parents' generation that were in like Nazi Germany wondering at what point should we be getting out, <laughs> you know, before they burned the books, after they burned the books, what would be a good time, you know? I mean, there's a thought process behind it, you know? Oh, so, so my wife and me, uh, the, the, the kids were leaving for school, for, for university. So we go like, this is a, as good as a time as ever to, um, to try something new. Hey, of course. And are you currently in the Bahamas? Is that where you are right now? I'm in the Bahamas. We, um, we uh, built a uh, hotel rental for the last um, few years. And in a way, it's a perfect uh, COVID getaway because once you're here, you never have to leave. The, it's, it's, it's a very secluded island. There are like three or four families living here. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the fact that I can talk to you this way is like a miracle of technology because it's as low tech as it gets. I'm uh, building a treehouse right now. True. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm building a treehouse. Wow. Well, someone's having a lot of fun in the Bahamas. And, and, I, and I'm glad now you've had a long career and we're going to deep dive into all of that. So I'm glad that you're having a chance to sit back, relax, enjoy the sun and just be secluded by the majority of society right now, especially with everything going on. You're, you're in Vancouver right now, correct? No, I'm in Toronto right now. Oh, you're in Toronto. On the yeah, other I, side. I, <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Um, I have uh, great, um, great memories of my shoots in Canada, in particular for Pathfinder. I was there for that. And, and, and you know, you don't make friends that fast and that easily anymore when you get my age. I made a lot of friends on one shoot, you know, a lot of people that I miss. So, you know, I'm, I, have a, I have a very warm place in my heart for Canada. Oh, well, well, that's beautiful. And thank you for saying that. And that's a common thread that I've heard in a lot of my interviews with a lot of different people with movie sets and movie filmings. It's you're this tiny little like eight week window or a six week window where it says go, go, go. And once you're done one, you're on to the next. So it's good to hear that you actually got a chance to create some really good lifelong friends from having this limited window of a shoot. It's, it's kind of like speed dating, you know, it's, it's, it's like you meet, you like, you know, make plans, you fall into bed together, you have children and then it's over, you know? So it's like, it's like all the phases of a, of a, of a proper <laughs> marriage, but like all done in two months, like you said, and, and, and I fell in love and got my heart broken the moment I left. Uh. <laughs> 
Well, hey, that's, uh, you heard it here first, so Marcus is about how the movie industry works. It's all love and heartbreak. That's right. <laughs> that's right. You have had such an interesting journey in this medium that has taken you so many different parts of the world. Before we really dive into your professional career, I want the audience to really get to know Marcus. Where does this all start? What were some of your early childhood influences and what made you want to be a content creator at such a young age? Well, it all goes back to a very strong mother complex. I'm kidding. Uh, they, you know, uh, um, in a way, making film is sort of satisfying the 15-year-old within me. And, uh, you know, and it goes back to the homages I've paid or hope to have paid in, uh, in some of the movies I've made because... They come from the place I was actually sort of like a frustrated Boy Scout in Germany. I was like crazy into Boy Scouting, I have to tell you. They had to kick me out because I got too old for it. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it was a misspent youth of reading comic books and building tree houses and, <laughs> and uh, uh, um, you know, telling each other our stories at the campsite about Jason or Leatherface and... Uh, and 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 that was all campers or road trippers, right? That uh, that get befallen. And then I actually called one of the movies Pathfinder, the one I did in Canada. And um, I guess it's my uh, back to nature kind of a thing. And it's also, you know, coming from a very well protected suburban lifestyle, you know, getting sort of a sensation of adventure and danger, you know, like. We're living such a world of uh, technology, the way we're talking right now. Right. We're looking at square screens and square rooms. Now, what if they take us out and throw us into a live or die situation, you know, with a bunch of friends? How would we, how would we manage? So that, that was always, like, much more interesting for me, you know? Like, um, uh, I think I will never be an important filmmaker that does, like... Uh, you know, the Oscar type of movies. I'm way more interested in getting a spoof on Mad Magazine or <laughs> or, or, or action figures. <laughs> right. Hey, well, well, you have your very own style of directing. And as you mentioned, um, you're not that cookie cutter Hollywood kind of director. You You take from a lot of your own experiences and a lot of the things that you like. You have this anarchist kind of nature about you where you're just, this is how I feel. This is how I view things. And let's throw them out. At what point did you realize that, hey, this is what I want to do as a career? You know, I think the question goes deeper to what I want to do as my career, but why I chose to live the way you just described. Um, when I was 16 years old, I watched um, the streets of San Francisco, and it was all about some kid getting brainwashed by a guru and it just uh, screws them all up and then they have to brainwash them back. So Carl Malden and Michael Douglas have to pull them back, you know, to his parental mm -hmm. home. So the next day I went to the flea market and there are people all decked out in orange uh, selling their clothes, right? And, 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 and trying to get their trip to India, right? And so I walked up to them and I said, so, so who's your master? And they say, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And I go, okay, you know, uh, uh, where can I get material on him? And they're so sick and tired of answering the same old questions about the Rolls Royces and whatnot, right? Yeah. So they're all like, you know, go and buy yourself a book. And I'm going like, these guys are supposed to indoctrinate me now. What am I, sour milk? What's wrong? <laughs> you know, so I bought a book and I fell in love with the man immediately. You know, I looked at the mala and I said, I want to be part of this. Um, it was actually the only place where people didn't tell me what to do or believe or think and how to act in Germany um, after the war, which was still a pretty deterministic place. So I would go to his darshans and one day he made a, he made a lecture, he did a lecture and the lecture was, well, somebody asked him questions. He always answered questions. And the question was, mm -hmm. um, Bhagwan, you're so permissive. In your book, is there any such thing as sin? And he said, no, not really. Well, maybe with one exception. He says, anything that you do that goes against your own nature. And I go like, he's talking about arithmetic. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I hated math. Oh. And in seventh grade, 
I decided I will not do math anymore. Now imagine you have a child, you know, who at seventh grade decides I'll do everything but math because my master told me so. Uh, sounds a lot like me. Uh, math, no go. No go. No go. No go. So it was, um, it was um, kind of like pretty anarchic there for a while. And, and so what I started, I would do projects with the Boy Scouts. That was my first film crew with my school. I did a school newspaper. I always loved to do something together with others. And doing film was very interesting. But they assigned a teacher to look over the newspaper. And he turned out to be my math teacher. But he took a liking in the fact that, you know, I did something. And so he would always propel me into the next class, even though I knew shit about what was going on. And in 10th grade, 11th grade, when all these school classes were combined, this was a higher learning, higher school, I got a new math teacher and it was a disaster on the first day. <laughs> so I made all the newspapers in Germany, but it wasn't like, poor kid, he's dyslexic with numbers, which by the way I am. Um, the tenure of it was more like, what's wrong with our school system that a loser like this can make it all the way to 11th grade? In all the, in all the big magazine, it was a big embarrassment to all. And uh, yeah, so they tested me and um, they tried to see what's wrong with me. And um, the, the, the school psychologist made a chart. And according to the chart, he held it up in front of my parents and me. Um, I, I, I can claim genius status. However, he said, it's even more so amazing that the math test was part of the equation. So he goes like this, he goes like, this is a chart of a regular child. Then he says, this is a chart of a child with Down syndrome for math. And this is the okay. test. I scored below Down syndrome for wow. the number test. And I still don't know my address. I don't know my phone number. This whole logging in thing was a nightmare. And uh, really, yeah, wow. yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I can't, I, I actually, I do know my birthday. It's the one date I know. And I have to remember an image of my, of, of, of the date that I was born on a, way, on a birthday cake that I had when I was a child. And, and it's that image that I can remember, but abstract numbers I don't do. So at an airport, I can't read the charts or a bus schedule, forget about okay. it. Yeah. So what is it like? Do you take like a photo of like your phone number or your address and you refer to that on your phone? Or if you're in a situation where you have to refer to those? I, I have a visual uh, photographic memory. So for example, before the internet where you could Google any picture, I would have photo books. I love photo books. And it would be a gigantic library full, really gigantic. Mm -hmm. And if you would say, what's that picture where the guy kisses the girl on some black and white taken in the 40s, 50s in Paris? And I go, that's do as you know. And I would know exactly where the book is and where I would have to crack it open. And with maybe four or five pages difference, I could find the image. Oh. Wow, that's uh, some cool facts here by Mr. Marcus and Spell here. <laughs> but I don't do numbers. Well, you don't do okay. numbers. You know, it makes the two of us, my friends. So we're not going to do any numbers today. Well, that makes us interested in visuals, doesn't it? Oh, of you course. I, I, that's one thing that's very really interesting that you brought up is a lot of content creators and visualists. There's, although we're so different in different spectrums, there's some commonality between all of us, I feel. And I can relate more to someone who is in a photography or making films rather than someone who maybe is a bit more book smart, who's into math or science. And it's, it's funny because my brother is becoming a doctor and I see his books and there's no way on earth that I could comprehend any of that. It's just, it blows my mind yeah. how, how we're so different. And yet, yet you are from the same gene pool. Yeah. Um, my, sons are, um, my sons are twins. And at the beginning, I thought it would be really interesting to see their similarities. But really, all you celebrate every day are the differences. They couldn't be more different from each other, you know? One is into coding, the other is going to art school, you know? Um, 
very, very different and and all good, you know. Uh, I wish I would have both sides of the brain. Uh, regrettably, I only function on one half. <laughs> uh, well, hey, your one half has done wonders in this medium. So let's let's dive right into some of that. You were a recipient of the Fulbright Scholarship, and that's a very prestigious scholarship. Actors like Dolph Lundgren and John Lithgow, they're some of the fellow recipients as well of that. How did that all come about? And specifically, what was your first move to America like? Were you a fish out of water? Were you more excited that you're going to be able to flourish and show off all your colors rather than just being pigeonholed in maybe Germany or where you were? How did that all go? You know, I'm still with Dolph Lundgren. (laughs) (laughs) What does that tell you about the Fulbright Commission and the way they make their choices? <laughs> I'm definitely not going to get into that. <laughs> well, that's the interesting thing, no? Like, I'm the greatest scholastic failure that I know myself about from Germany. And I got one of the highest, <laughs> most prestigious scholarships. I always tell that story to parents that think something is wrong with their kids, you know? Because if you follow your passions and if you mm-hmm. make rebellion, I mean, that's what Bhagwan taught me is the rebellious spirit. Let it all out, you know? And, and even if that means going against the system, oh, you should be a lawyer, you should be a doctor, you should go the path of your brother. Is he older? You know, do what he does. Uh, um, and here you sit and you have very different interests. And, 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 and maybe sometimes you sit back and you go like, something wrong with me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, but that's your path and, will, and, and if you allow it to happen, it will open doors, you know. Your enthusiasm alone, I can tell, you know, already is. So, uh, uh, so in any case, um, coming to America was always a plan because uh, I knew I couldn't do in Germany what I wanted to do. Um, to be a director, you had to look as old as I look now. But <laughs> when, I was, when I was, you know, a, 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 a 17, 18 year old, you know, you couldn't be a Steven Spielberg. You know, in Germany, you had to be a Marty Scorsese is already a professor and a doctor or whatever, you know. Um, So I knew I had to get past that. And New York, more than anything, was a great equalizer because uh, in in a city that's decisively capitalist, it doesn't matter if you're German amongst Jews, if you're white amongst Blacks, you know, uh, uh, if you're rich or poor, male, female, gay, straight, you know, if they can make money off my back, I'm invited, you know? So that's a great thing. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed that. And uh, there are not a lot of places like that. So uh, uh, it gave me a lot of chances really early on. Um, I, I started at a company that did feature film advertising. Um, <laughs> so, so, so mm-hmm. yeah, it was a company that did feature film advertising. Um, I wound up there after a brief stint in, in, in regular advertising. And, you know, they did the alien egg, they did the Ghostbuster logo, all that kind of stuff. And I went like, that's the place for me. And uh, we did a lot of opening titles there. Um, in the first month, yeah. coming out of complete um, obscurity, being art director for Chiquita, Chiquita Bananas, in the first month I was working for Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, uh, Ivan Reitman. That was just the first month. And uh, uh, so it was a great place because not only that I could do fun visual work, I got to work for all my idols. And I always considered them to be immortals. I felt directing is for immortals, right? But yeah, when you present for them, like if you do a poster, I don't know if you know that, but back in the days you had to show like 80 comps. And, and you know, I went like, this is crazy. Uh, let's make the first presentation just small. And um, James Cameron, I worked on Aliens, sent it back unopened. And he says, full, full size bitch. <laughs> Sounds like a very James Cameron thing to do. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you get to know them. And what I realized was, you know, Steven Spielberg is chewing fingernails. Um, uh, uh, A lot of them came to us because we were sort of the last resort when they had a problem picture like uh, Francis Ford Coppola and Gardens of Stone, right? Um, It was a problem picture or so it was perceived by the studio. So 
you see them sweating bullets because this is sort of like their last ditch effort to save the project. And I realized they're mortal. And, and, and very often they would make decisions I wouldn't have made out of fear, you know? And I go like, wow, you know, if somebody goes for the safe way or yeah. uh, uh, the straightforward way, and I go like, I didn't expect that to come from them, you know? Um, I've worked on Aliens, I've worked on The Untouchables, uh, Dirty Dancing, that was the time. And, um, and um, when I decided to go on my own was a time of music videos. That was like a good entrance yeah. for a loser who never like finished school because I stopped the Fulbright scholarship after two months and went like, this is boring. I want to work for an ad <laughs> agency or I can learn more here at the, at the optical house doing film. Right, you know. and, and it's funny you brought up music videos because you've had a very successful career in directing some icons of the industry, Janet Jackson, Sir Elton John, the Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first professional gig in the music industry? And is it difficult to separate, let's say we're working with Sir Elton John right now, is it difficult to separate Elton John the icon, the aura from Elton John, the actor that you're trying to direct? You know how easy it is uh, to separate? Um, right now, I would watch an interview with one of the people I've worked for, closely with. Okay. And I think of them as people I only know from TV, and then I have to remind myself, I'm like, yeah, I'd like, um, you know, I ate pizza with that guy, <laughs> or like, you know. <laughs> I had a drink with that guy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it's an odd... Um, you almost separate the persona that they portray from the person you've met. You know, you know the outtakes, you know them with the pants down, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, you really separate that in their head. For me, it's very abstract right now. And I really have to remind myself to watching documentaries or whatever, you know. Oh yeah, I was like part of that. I was right there. You know, it's interesting when I was born, um, well, when I was growing up, uh, I was born 63. When I see those black and white pictures of segregation and, 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 and people protesting in the streets, I think of that as like generations before me. And I was there right for it. You never know where you are when it's happening. Yeah. You know? And music video in a way, um, from all my questionable uh, achievements, music videos is maybe the one I'm most proud of because I really do believe that it was another American art form, right? But completely on its own, kind of like jazz. It was sort of like that kind of a thing. While in commercials, it's much more, much more replicative. So for example, you only get the kind of work you already have on your reel, you know? And in movies, you only get the kind of work that kind of somebody did before and you can do a variation of it, unless you're really on the top of the game and write your own book, you know? Um, so music videos was really the only place where your clients came from the acoustic field, not the visual field. They had no idea what you were talking about. They had no idea what your references are. Talk to them about Dwezzy No and the couple kissing on you know and show right. the picture oh, yeah, okay they go along with it but the day of the shoot for them is kind of like going to the dentist you know it's like something you have to do because their first success experience was performing in front of a crowd a live audience and in a way that was the one thing i enjoyed doing features because i've never seen my work with or in front of a live audience so you make a music video make a commercial and when it airs, you pat yourself on the shoulder, go, I've done great work here. But the reality has that people go and fix themselves a grilled cheese sandwich or take a leak, you know? <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Waiting for the big show to start. So, so, yeah, so that's sort of like the elliptical nature of, you know, or, or the sequencing of... Um, yeah, a lot of people ask me, is it easier to get into music videos? Is it easier to get into film? Is it easier to do documentaries first? And what I found out is all equally hard mm -hmm. in the beginning. And it's all like a little miracle if it works out. But, you know, uh, uh, and it's all very incestuous, you know. It's, you, you can't really recommend one path over the other. And now all bets are off because none of it is existent anymore. Yeah, that's true. What am I going to tell my kids? Hey, do what I did. You do well. 
just just look at what daddy has done and and people feel it's a birthright to download anything they see on the internet my last movies were downloaded um well my former agent uh started an a company that tries to put an end to illegal downloading right how can we stop this and he said he asked me to sign some petition right and he said uh you know your movie conan um if people would have paid two dollars for each illegal download that was made from it you would have made an additional hundred million dollars when I heard of that, I went like, I'm out. Yeah. And as you mentioned about the whole birthright thing, kids from my generation, being a kid of the 90s, you're right. People that I speak to or with YouTube, it's so easy to access media than ever before. It's like, oh, I'm going to watch, you know, let me listen to the song. All right, let's go on YouTube. Oh, let's download it and put it on my phone. We don't realize the implications right. that it really has on people that are relying on this as part of their salary, their income, or let's say it's something like Conan. If you made that extra $100 million, who knows if that could have opened up doors for potential sequels, potential other things down the line. And I feel like in the world of streaming, that's kind of changing as well, where I think people and filmmakers and musicians, they're being forced to adapt to this new ideology that, hey, people don't want to pay as long, even though that's, that's terrible and piracy, you know, I'm totally against it, but that's just the way the world seems to be moving now. Like, how do you combat that if you can? Well, how do you adapt uh, to the fact that like, look, my, my wife and me, we would go out on a weekend, go to Soho, buy a huge stack of magazines. Cause that's the only place where you saw glossy pictures. I would like, you know, tear them out, make mood charts out of it. That's going to be my next music video. Right now. You know, back then, photographers would get paid to take those pictures. And now, my wife now, she goes on Instagram. She has all her favorite accounts. And she just goes, tuk, 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 tuk. she stopped reading glossy magazines. So they don't exist anymore, right? Um, it's sort of like a lifeline that gets destroyed. You know, my son that's interested in coding, he went to art school first. And he's still, he's very much an artist. And, and uh, uh, Armin, my other son, you know, is already selling his art and, you know, still in art school. And uh, what Bruno is trying to figure out is there's a system, he will tell you what it's called, where you um, essentially scan in your art. And if somebody uses it in a magazine or in an exhibit or whatever, they get immediately charged. Okay. It's essentially coded art, you know, so that when you view it, it almost becomes like a credit card, you know, the moment you access it, the moment the image matching catches you, you get charged for it if you like it or not. I think that's a really interesting way to go. Um, but I think all these laws that um, they have in place uh, to protect creatives and their art, um, they're not being enforced because any politician going against Google or going against Facebook or Instagram is going to be shut down immediately. Yeah. They can't afford that. So the laws exist, but nobody's enforcing them. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens in this medium as the next generations come in. And I think it's one of those things where creators now, like as you mentioned with Instagram or just even your phone, everyone can be a director or a creator or a photographer just by something they have in their pockets every day. Yeah. It is so easy now. And these things have come such a long way where you can take professional photos or heck, you can record a whole movie and edit it yeah. on your smartphone. Yeah. So we'll see where the future of this medium really goes. Well, wait, that's interesting also in regards to what you're doing here. Um, you see, what good is a commercial if you take commerciality out of it, right? It's all about commerce. That includes the people that are making it. And um, so if you go to an ad agency, or if you did back in the days when there were like still 10 stories mm -hmm. to an ad agency, um, you say, okay, I want, um, I want to open my account. You start with a million dollars. Now I would like a account executive who communicates to me. That's another million dollars. I need a writer, another million dollars, an art director, another million dollars. I want to make a commercial. That'll cost you a million dollars, but you also need to hire a director. That's another million dollars, right? Because the agency charges on top. There are agents, they're in between, right? Right. And on top of it, 
they're creatively imposing themselves on the creative and sometimes even on the client, right? So it's very uneasy, but uh, there's a lot of money to be made because that's a lot of money for 30 seconds that I just talked about, right? All right. So now that I decide to be in the concierge business, <laughs> I, I, I went to, I went to uh, Morocco with my wife. We were traveling around the world and we were staying at a Riyadh in Morocco. And checking in is a family, flaxen blonde hair, beautiful tan, everybody beautiful photo model. Oh, yeah mother to the father the father is like actually carrying some equipment he turns out to be a photographer right and she uh must be a model right in any case to make a long story short i talked to the owner and i said who are these people and she goes oh these are influencers they invite themselves to hotels and then we hope they take photos and we hope they write something nice and post it i go like that is wild so i'm going back to my room and I go like, I wonder who they are. I didn't catch the name. So I'm just, because I have nothing else to do, I Google family of blonde, beautiful influencers. And 50 families come up, right? So now I'm looking at this particular, I, I see the family <laughs> on the pictures, right? And I go like, that's them. Oh, yeah. So I look at it. So they have like $5 million, five million. Following people. them, yeah. I, I, so, so here's their story. She is a former photo model from Australia. She invented a fashion line. That's why they were so color coordinated. And she books herself at hotels or locations that go in the tonality of, their, of her clothes. And uh, uh, her husband happens to be a photographer. And the kids travel along and they're in the pictures. Okay, you got a photographer, you got a creative director, you got the models, you got a family that's already precast and in sync, and they have their own $5 million following. And you didn't pay a dollar yet, right? Yeah. And everybody seems to win. So at that point, the latest I went, I'm done with commercials. Why bother? <laughs> and now with COVID, everybody goes straight to the influencers. People like to talk smack about them, but there is usually a reason why they have a big following and uh, put agencies out of business because, and, and, and so that obliterated nine stories out of a 10 story ad agency. The only ones left is a design department, the creatives that were always only creating red numbers, right? The misfits, very strange, strange times. Yeah, and it's just progressing more and more in that way as social media just continues to rise and continues to gain that influence. It's gonna be really interesting to see the next 10 years of influencing and where that really goes. On the topic of uh, movies, because I'm a giant, giant fan of this franchise. And your first blockbuster in this medium, it was one of the biggest iconic horror movie franchises reimagining of all time, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Here you are, this badass director who's, who goes against the grain, and you have this big studio tentpole. And it's a massive reimagining, remake, reboot, whatever you want to call it of this iconic franchise. Did you say reboot? Reboot. <laughs> reboot. It's a reboot, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> reboot with a T, my friends, with a T. <laughs> what were your initial thoughts when you were offered this position of directing this movie? And what were the biggest challenges from transitioning over from music videos where you're given this two to five minute time constraint a lot of time to create and wrap up a vision versus a 90 minute motion feature that has a budget of multi-million dollars. What was your experience like on that? And was there any pressure having to reboot this iconic franchise? Well, my, my first experience actually was a movie that I didn't wind up making. It was End of Days with Arnold Schwarzenegger and it was supposed to be a $120 million movie. And I never did anything longer than five minutes or four and a half minutes. Oh, wow. So, so I, it was not the kind of movie I wanted to do, but I, I think I just watched Fincher seven, who's somewhat of a contemporary. And I went like, yeah, I want to do something dark. Cause I never get to do that in commercials, but then it's an Arnold movie and that comes with his own set of rules and complications. And, um, I, I, uh, because of many, many reasons of things that I didn't feel were in place, 
I actually decided not to make the movie because I realized that after doing Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I got $2 million for productions and I could do just pretty much everything with it. While on the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, I got $120 million and I couldn't do anything with it. You know, it was like, I, I couldn't put myself and I couldn't, you know, even though Chainsaw was a remake, I felt I could do something more personal with it, you know, uh, than, than, than I could do on the other movie, you know, but there's so many forces at play. You know, on a movie, you're, I keep on using the analogy, you're a dog with, uh, a dog on many leashes with many masters, you know. What was the experience like? Was it what you thought a movie set would be or what it was it like the studio trying to meddle in because here they are investing this large amount of money in this iconic franchise and they've gone ahead and made five other sequels to the texas chainsaw after the one that came out none of them are really that good to be honest that first one i'm going to give you a lot of credit it was one of the earlier horror movies i ever watched and i have a huge soft spot for horror movies they're just one of my favorite genres how did that all go? Like, was it what you expected or what exactly happened? Well, your, your tender age kind of <laughs> like um, betrays, <laughs> you know, the, the, it does. The, the achievement. Because, you see, I believe that horror movies at a certain point all become the same. And it's the first 10 that you watch that, I mean, the scares, the mechanism. You know, uh, Cabin Woods makes a good uh, good point. Makes a good point for that. They they show you that, like Penn and Teller, they show you uh, the tricks. They show you their hand. This is how we do that, you know. And then they have fun with that. So that was pretty unique. But otherwise, everything kind of follows a certain tried and proven template, right? Uh, especially the Six Kids in the Woods kind of movies. Oh yeah. And and um, so I believe that. Whatever you see first, before you know the vocabulary, before you know the tricks, those are the movies. You know, you talk to anybody of my generation, it will be The Exorcist, The Omen, Rosemary's Baby. You know, it's always the same ones. Now you talk to the younger generation, they said, oh, you know, I was scared to death watching House of Wax. You know, and I don't know <laughs> what, you know. <laughs> and sometimes that still happens, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, but it's the first... The first set that got thrown on you always seems to be the freshest, even though it's all out of the can to a certain extent, you know. Um, transitioning from Texas Chainsaw, you also had a chance to work on Friday the 13th. Here's this mega franchise as well, where they're trying to reboot it or remake it to a whole new generation. What were the lessons that you learned that you took over to that from Texas Chainsaw, especially in making a horror movie? Mm, well, um, there are many answers to you, you learn so much doing them and you know so little while you're doing them in hindsight you you know much more um one thing that combines them all that i find interesting for all those that want to start their own franchise and are listening in is uh what i learned from the writers because the writers are the true fans yeah um, much more authentic friends than i am because you know for me it was just like something I watched. I mean, none of these movies meant for me what The Exorcist means, and none of my movies should mean anything like The Exorcist either, right? That was for me the high watermark of what a scary movie should be. But what I found out when I talked to the writers, they never referred to Jason or to Leatherface as the villain. They called him, he's our anti-hero. They all used that term. And the villain was usually the good looking blonde guy who's a <laughs> jerk and doesn't collaborate, you know, and everybody dies. Um, that's the true villain, you know, it's the weakest link in that survival game, right? But, but the rest, they're, they're anti heroes. And if you look at them, they were all slighted, they were all wronged. Yeah. Right. And they, they had to come around. In fact, there were two scenes in Texas Chainsaw Massacre that they wanted me to throw out. And I got the least into. Oh, yeah. Any movie I've done. Uh, but those, there were two scenes that they were gunning for. One was where Leatherface takes his mask off to put the camper mask on, and you see his destroyed face. You know? Yeah, it, I remember that. Yeah, kids were making fun of him in school, and, and now he's wearing those pretty kids' faces 
to recreate an identity he has lost, right? That's what that shot meant to me. And the other one was when his proverbial parents are fighting, ironing the pants down in the living room, he's up in his kid's den, like a little child chewing fingernails, listening through the half open door, right? He's kind of like a child. And, 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 and clearly they were gunning for it because of a sort of a vulnerability, but, but Jason and Leatherface have that vulnerability. Uh, Jason drowned while the camp counselors were, were fucking each other, right? So, so uh, uh, nobody took care of him. And he was like a, 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 um, you know, a, a disadvantaged child, right? Right. They're, they're, they're in, I think, lies the secret of a, of a great franchise. Yeah, I, I agree. So on the last topic of horror movies, there's a lot of people who are listening that are really interested in either filmmaking or just even generally connecting with these movies. What's it like on the set of a horror movie? Is it like any other movie? Are there times where it gets a little, you know, a little, a little creepy or because of the environment you guys are creating? How is it like? The only creepy thing are the producers. <laughs> And, and they're scary too. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, they know I kid. They know I kid. That was a joke, everyone. Um, God, um, you know, that's a strange thing. You put the buttons in, you cast it, you scout it, you, 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 you work on the scares, you know, and prep. You've put the buttons there, you push them. So it doesn't scare you really, right? It was an interesting thing that happened on Texas Chainsaw because while I was editing it, <clears throat> I went, you know, with a with the talented Glenn Scantlebury, of course. Of course. While I while we were editing it, um, I went like, it looks okay. The performance are good. I'm pretty much happy with what we've done here. Surprise, surprise, because while you're doing it, you think this is gonna be a train wreck. <laughs> and 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 it's always like kind of like works itself out. And then you go, but there's one thing I don't know, is it scary? I can't tell what's scary because in theory, you only know in theory, you put it there, <clears throat> but it doesn't hit you for the first time. And then Michael Bay actually had two desires after he saw it. He said, <clears throat> we got to do an additional shoot day and we're going to shoot Leatherface one more time coming out of the woods with one arm and the chainsaw lashing out yeah. at Aaron's car. <clears throat> okay. You know, they don't want the legend to die, right? I wanted to do a man and be done with it, right? The other one was uh, the pepper kill. They wanted to do something different, uh, uh, something more intense. So we shot like some shots of that. In any case, I'm shooting it. And the next day I'm coming to the editing room <clears throat> and I want to talk about the additional scenes and the editors watching the end of the movie. And what I didn't know is he put the scenes already in. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. So I'm watching what I thought I watched already 20 times or hundreds of times and it was just smoothing it out. And suddenly what I shot was in there and I went, oh! <laughs> Got you, huh? And I shrieked at my own movie. That's the only time I had that experience. You know, you, you, it's hard to, <clears throat> you, you don't watch it like the audience. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. And on the last subject of movies, you've had a chance to direct some of, some of the best actors and some of the most popular actors, you know, Jessica Biel, Arlie Ermey. The one that stands out the most to me, and this is pre this gentleman really blew up and is such a massive star today, Jason Momoa in Conan the Barbarian. Talk about some of your memories on set being with Jason. And is he genuinely in person the same way, like the charismatic enigma that he is that we all see on TV and on like Instagram? Like uh, talk about uh, the shooting of that. Yeah, what you see is what you get. Yeah, uh, sounds like it, yeah. He's exactly that. And to such an extent that he was a very hard sell for the studio. They went like, watch Twilight. You can use anybody from Twilight. I said, none of them looks like Conan. Well, there's one, you know, who did a lot of push-ups waiting for his shots on Twilight. Probably like Taylor Lautner or Kellen Lutz, one of those guys, I'm sure. I won't say. So <laughs> I went like, you know, that's not, a, in fact, we need somebody that, um, we need somebody that people don't know yet, that, that, that doesn't have any baggage, right? And on the other hand, we also need somebody who gets away with stuff. 
I give you an example. I, I, I looked at Conan and I went like, technically it's an epic, but epic is also always for do-gooders. If it's Moses or if it's like, you know, they're, they're always like Christ, Christianity informed kind of guys, right? Uh, because they were invented by Cecil B. DeMille uh, to get the Christian Bible Belt to come to the movie houses, which they deemed immoral places, dancing girls, gunslingers, you know, not far. So he would give them the Ten Commandments and movies like that, Ben-Hur, right? Sure, yeah. So I went like, Conan is not that. He's not virtuous that way, right? He's sort of like uh, more politically incorrect. He's actually a politically incorrect epic hero. So who in this politically um, uh, a correct age gets away with like grabbing a woman's ass while drinking out of a stein, you know, it's like, like that. Yeah. Who's that kind of a guy, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger does it. And I've seen him do stuff like that. You know, the women laugh and maybe he gets laid by that very same woman at the end of the day, you know, Sean Connery, he was one of the last guys that got away with it, right? By today's standards, lots of misogynism. But even now, a woman, a man, watch it. And they can agree that he's a cool dude. So where's the difference, right? And I went like, whoever Conan is, got to have that enzyme or otherwise it's not going to work. And I found that Jason had that. But he was a very tough sell to the studio because I went like, well, we know him from shit, you know? Yeah. This is before, like, you know, he grew up on Game of Thrones and Aquaman and Justice League. This is the early days where all he really had was Baywatch on his resume. Well, Game of Thrones was, even though it aired before Conan, was shot after Conan was completed. So he hasn't played the primordial kind of stuff yeah. yet, right? Um, but um, so they said, well, we don't know. And look at his voice, you know, uh, he's trying too hard with his voice. I said, that's how he talks. You know, you can put a bucket on your head. <laughs> you will talk like Jason Momoa. He talks like that in real life. He's not acting that, right? So I said, listen, I bring him to Lionsgate. You guys will see him. You make up your mind. You will see he embodies this character. So I walk with him through Lionsgate. And in order to get to the conference room, you have to walk through where all the cubicles are, the, these open roof cubicles where the... Uh, with the uh, uh, secretaries and so on sit, right? Sure. And all the heads went, whoop, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ooh, what just walked by, you know? And he got the part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that well, that, that's so great, because he, he just, there's something about him that just you gravitate towards him. Like, you, he walks by, or if you see him on TV, you're like, who is that? Yeah. And it's something like The Rock, like even like they have this intangible that, you know, you, you just can't, yeah. create and that's why you know kudos to both of them they're just killing it you don't find that kind of actor much anymore who's the next sean connery you know who's the next yeah. arnold schwarzenegger um uh avi lerner the uh producer uh i told him um he, he kept on saying uh marcus who's gonna be the conan <laughs> i said i don't know you gotta have chutzpah <laughs> 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 and i think jason had chutzpah uh, he had tons of it. Now, <laughs> transitioning over to where you currently are right now. Beautiful beachfront. I can see the sun. Talk a little bit about the Exuma Outpost. You know, you know uh, um, I, um, like I said, at a certain point, I, I think with this whole business, it's all about timing. There was a best time to make um, music videos. And there was a best time to do commercials. I mean, I started pretty much the year in, in advertising and commercials when Ridley Scott's uh, George Orwell commercial for Macintosh came out, right? Commercials were transformed. They became a different thing. Flex your cinematic muscle, you know? And, uh, and then, uh, um, you know, the dot commerce, they were all like, hey, we're the next rock and roll stars. You know, we want commercials that look like that so I could bring my music video background to work. And then the movie people went like, hey, yeah, we, we saw that commercial, we saw that music video. So like, there was a best time for everything. And even though I don't think I hit the best time to make feature films. Three in a row, right? It was Texas Chainsaw Friday, Conan. But I brought them back for better or worse. You know, at a certain point, it starts to smell rancid. And you look back at it and you say like, look, you know, now this internet thing is coming out. There are all these illegal downloads. Clients want to pay less for it you get less for it, you know. Uh, it really doesn't make sense 
I did better doing music videos, you know, than I did on my feature film project. And um, at that point, I went like, well, you know, I never, I never sold the place we built in New York. I never sold the place we built in Malibu. We were building a place in the Bahamas at the time. And I said, you know what? They're all places where like large families, sometimes like small groups of friends, up to 20 people can stay. Uh, they all either have big swimming pools and ocean access and so on. I said, you know what? Why don't I make accessible what I like? I can travel around the world for the rest of my life. And I get into the business of creating real life adventures, you know, where, and a lot of the people that come, come from the industry, you know, and they're looking for something special and they're looking for an experience, right? So uh, and these are all painfully um, uh, private places, you know, very serene and private places. Like, <laughs> i tell you a funny story. Um, I was sitting at, um, at the beach trying to make up my mind if this is where I want to live for the rest of my life. And I'm like reading a book by Werner Herzog and for an entire week not one person walked by wow and i was so glad to be far away from <laughs> horror and from hollywood which is pretty much the same <laughs> so so uh, uh um i'm sitting there and the guy walks by and and he he looks at me and he has a good looking guy right and then he comes back and he says oh it's the werner herzog book uh I love Werner Herzog. I said, yeah, I like Werner Herzog a lot too. Uh, and he goes, uh, uh, do you direct? And I go like, yeah. I said, do you direct? And suddenly I go, it's a guy who directed Hostel. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I go like, what are you doing here? He says, well, I just got that movie, um, uh, uh, Meg, the shark movie. Yeah, Jason Statham, yeah. Yeah, but he didn't wind up directing it. But at the time, it looked like he would. So he was there for Shark Week at the Bahamas to put his arm in a mesh, in a chain link mesh into a shark's throat wow. <laughs> yeah, to promote his movie. I said, you're a bigger director than I would ever be, or would ever have been. So, so, so you can't escape the business, even if you're here, you know, and I'm afraid I'm sort of bringing a part of it to town. Um, we're trying to promote the outpost in the Bahamas for the great underwater shooting because the clarity is like Evian. So a lot of, you know, swimsuit illustrated photo shoots happen here and stuff like that. And a lot of film shoots come here. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. That was shot right here where we have the outpost. Wow. Um, so so uh, it's, it's, it's remote, undestroyed beaches. Uh, Tropic of Cancer Beach, I can literally walk from our house for like three or four hours without seeing a soul or a house. And it's the most beautiful beach in the world. And uh, it's unique about the Bahamas. They have strong rules where you can build or not build. So okay. they keep it, you know, it's not like uh, what you normally have where you have like all these, this mass tourism, you know, so you can escape it. Yeah. So I'm here right now, like hunkering down while COVID is still a reality and, you know, trying, how, how are things where you are? How are things in Toronto? It's up and down. We it got pretty intense in Toronto when it kind of first broke out back in April. We had a very strict lockdown where all non-essential businesses were closed. So grocery store lineups were at least two, three hours before you can go in and get out. So that was pretty tough. Uh, we managed to flatten the curve as the summer came along due to some of those restrictions. But when school reopened, and people were forced to go back to work, cases started spiking again. And now we're double and triple the amount of cases we had at the original lockdown. So the government's talking a lot about shutting more things down or putting in yeah. more lockdowns. And it's tough because a lot of people rely on, you know, for their everyday life, they need the income. How, do, how does a family of five or six survive when they're not able to work? Uh, I'll give credit to the government of Canada. They did provide emergency relief for a lot of the people who are eligible for it, but it's still not enough, right? Yeah. So we're just masking up, well, keeping our space and just doing what we can. But look, you have a social system and a healthcare system that can only help in a situation like that. And in America, they don't have it and to divide them. And, and Americans are supposed to 
Canadians don't like to listen to what they're being told. It's their idea of freedom um, to what infect each other and uh, be thoughtless. You know, uh, I couldn't take it anymore. I literally couldn't take it anymore. I went like, I got to get out of this. Um, uh, it's just too crazy, you know, and, and, and I hope it will come around, but I think it will take more than one presidency to fix what has been ruined. You know? Right. I, I agree with that. And um, as someone that mentioned about timing and how important you said there is a time to be a movie director, a time to be a music video director. Now you're in this next stage of your life are you content are you happy is there you know from being behind the camera being this artistic guru that you are being in the middle of nowhere are you happy are you content how's life i miss the camaraderie i miss people like you and i'm not saying this to oh, thank you, you but people that can be enthusiastic about things island life is not about enthusiasm it's very much the way of the middle everything is so calm you know like like the ocean here so the internet <laughs> is unstable i thought it was me who's unstable it's the internet let me see so uh um yeah like like um you know, you miss the highs, but you don't miss the lows. So it evens itself out, I guess. And so you slowly get into the island spirit. It's very different. Like, for example, you know, I did over 2,000 commercials, what, six movies. Uh, I did TV, uh, over 250 music videos. And never did I have a no-show from crew or actors. Pretty amazing, right? I never lost a shoot day because somebody didn't show up. Right. And over here, it's funny. Like, I had to like bring down some trees. I needed a guy with a chainsaw and then three guys that helped me carrying the stuff. So the guy with the chainsaw oh. doesn't show up. Now I have to pay all the others and they can't do anything. Right. So I see the guy three days later on the streets and I said, where were you? And he goes, well, the, the, it, was a, it was a sunny day. So <laughs> I didn't come. Now, he didn't say that with any scorn or spite, right? He really meant it. it. It was like a child saying it to you, you know? It's like, it came from his heart. But there was also no sense of apology. Of, well, of course, the sun was out, right? So I go like, where I come from, that's a major insult. <laughs> you know what I mean? With the process. Yeah, okay. that's fair. And so it was like a week later, and I saw him selling lobster out of his trunk in front of the market, right? And he must have had like 25 lobsters in there, right? So on a good day, they go fishing and they catch those lobsters. These lobsters sell for 25 bucks. He made more with what he had in that trunk from this one time going out fishing than he would make in a week doing hard labor for me. In a way, I'm thankful that he gave me any time of day at all. And that's very different from being a director in Hollywood. Well, that's beautiful. Now, as we wrap up here with Mr. Marcus as well, what is the one piece of advice that you would give to anyone who is either looking to go down a path of content creation, being a filmmaker, being a director? What would you say? I'm looking to my own sons now. And like I said before, anything I've learned doesn't apply anymore in this new age of media where you control your own media um so we're all talking about platforms right now there was a time where a great movie would be made because goldwyn was behind it or mayor right there was a warner brothers look an mgm look then that changed to um a director oh billy wilder i'm in right the director would make and and, and, and sell the movie. Then it was an actress uh, or an actor. Mm -hmm. Oh, Marilyn Monroe's in it, you know, or Tony Curtis is in it, right? And then that changed pretty much to uh, corporations and now platforms, right? Um, so that makes it tough because to say, hey, um, you got to see true lies because cineplex odeon right produced it you wouldn't have said that right that wouldn't be a reason for you to sign on to make the movie or to watch the movie right so that kind of gives me pause right is the platform really more important 
than what we provide as a filmmaker. And I would have challenged you on that before COVID and now after COVID, I think that was sort of like the final stab. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I don't envy young filmmakers. Now my sons will tell you that the opposite is true, that if you have a very specific idea of something, you can do that. I'll give you an example. Ridley Scott did uh, this Macintosh spot, right, back then. One minute, one million dollars, Super Bowl. Uh, yeah, and it changed sort of how we look at commercials. And in a way, what it said is, it said why the year 1941 won't be the year 1941, right? Uh, 41, what am I saying? 1981. See, I don't do numbers. I can't do numbers. I can't do numbers. 1981, right? When I, when 1980, I don't do numbers. So the George Orville thing. 1984. <laughs> 1981. All good. These are how bad it is. So in any case, you don't have no help either here. Um, so so I'm, 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 I, for me, it was a watermark of a great commercial. For everyone, it still is still the top list of commercials. So it was 20 years later uh um that macintosh hired a scott again to make a new spot for the super bowl also four million dollars and uh they hired jake scott ridley's son so i watched the spot and i go like mm, okay you know different people using different devices from the company in different places on earth i've done commercials like that there's nothing really all that new about it but then I saw as a making of, right? And there was Jake, and he was sort of like behind a computer and an editor going like, yeah, put this shot here, put that shot here, then, you know, put it here on that web link. And suddenly I realized in the making of that he didn't direct all of that. He didn't shoot all of that. It was different people, people like you and me all over the world that he would call, they would shoot whatever he describes or they would have an idea. Then they would edit it, they would put it together and they would put that and the documentary out on social media in channels that are available to them. So in a way, was it creative as stunning as what his mm -hmm. father did? No, but that was about them keeping the promise. You're your own cameraman. You're your own director. You're your own media company, just like those influencers in that Riyadh in Morocco. So take that camera, put something together that you feel might go viral or is a great idea and just put it out, you know, because you have a tool that we didn't have. We needed big equipment trucks. We couldn't just light it with a little LED and didn't, all that technology didn't exist. It's lightweight. It's cheap, it's affordable. There are people doing stuff on iPhones that is pretty amazing. So what you're doing here right now, I don't know. It's like for some people it replaces what used to be held by Johnny Carson or David Letterman. I don't know what, you know, where you where you can do your own show, you know, while while wearing a beanie and and <laughs> and a jean jacket and say like <laughs> That's it. We're all our own bosses now. And one thing I took away from everything you said is just hey. The world is yours. Go out there. You have things that I didn't have or people from your generation. So the ball's in your court. I think ideas, you know, ideas is, I miss that like advertising now is like a little banner ad or whatever they put and interrupt things with. They're very much about disruption. It's sort of a term. I hate that term because disruption alone doesn't replace a great idea that will really stick with you. You know, everything that's good, that goes viral, that goes, goes beyond just a quick click is uh, based on great ideas, you know, and you can put them on any kind of a platform. So there you go. There we go. Marcus, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. And, and truly, just even selfishly for me, that first Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, it's such a dear place in my heart. And I, I watched it when I was way too young to watch it. And you know what? I, I loved every second of it. So thank you for your contribution in this medium, music videos, movies. I wish you the best of luck in your next venture. And I, I really feel that, you know, some of the best things are still yet to come for Mr. Marcus Nispel. 
<laughs> I keep surprising. All right, you'll be good. Thank you. It's a real pleasure meeting you this way.